Alright, alright, folks. Uh, my apologies. I totally forgot I had something else to say. So, uh, I guess we can call this a bonus round. And, uh, I'll turn on the light there. Just wait for some people to pop on. Uh, switch the camera around. There we go. Hey there. Hello again, Lisa. I had more to say. I totally forgot. So here's the bonus round. Uh, something else I'd like to touch on tonight. Uh, yeah, hello again. A uh, little quick thing. Your gift is subject to you. Uh, the reason why I, want, why I want to touch on this is because this is something that is often very grossly misinterpreted in the church and sometimes deliberately so. Uh, I remember years ago, no, I knew this uh, this prophetess who uh, she said uh, she said to me, uh, "It's my gift. I'll do what, I'll do what I want with it. My gift is it's subject to me. If I got a word for somebody, I don't have to give it to them. I can decide not to." And she said this with such pride and such arrogance, and and she really thought she was right because she was taught this by her by by her leaders. Now, never mind that she was part of a group of people that they're pastors shut down the church without any notice and just abandoned them i was like you, you really want to cling to the, the what these people taught you <laughs> and this is what she she actually seemed she really believed this that uh and so i want to clarify this when the bible says that the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets let's look first let's look at it in its context uh in first corinthians chapter 14 uh where Paul is talking about spiritual gifts and he's dealing with or, the subject of order in the church. He says, let the prophet speak two or three let, and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sits by, let the first hold his peace. For you may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and that all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Now that's all part of one phrase. He says, the, the first part he says about them taking turns. And then if, if someone else hears something, that let the first one hold his peace. And then he gives the reason. The word for is, is in, in this kind of usage, is synonymous with the word because. Uh, so we can actually say, because you may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn, that all may be comforted. So one, it's about taking turns. That's reason number one. And here's reason number two. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. If they can take turns because your spirit, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophets. You can exercise some self-control. It's not that you can't help it. And I know a lot of people like to say, I just can't help it. Yes, you can. And here's here's the revelation. Something you got to understand about revelation knowledge. It's not just about what the text says. It's about what the text implies. See, this is given as the reason why you can take turns. You can take turns because the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Now, what else does that imply? If you, if the gift, if your spirit is subject to you, what does that really mean? Now, this person wanted to to say that it meant they could do whatever they want. That's not the case. I mean, we know from uh, from the book of Hebrews that even Christ came not to do his own will, but the will of the one who sent him. And we know from Luke, and, and if we put that together, Luke chapter 6, verse 40, we know that the disciples not above his master. So if Jesus couldn't do his own will and had to do God's, the, the Father's will, then you certainly can't do your will with his gift. Even though it was a gift, you belong to him. That's like if I give my dog a bone, He's still my dog. That's, that's technically still my bone. I'm just letting him have it. In fact, that's how they teach you how to deal with uh, with dominant dogs. Dogs that are from tough, uh, what they call bully breeds. That are very tough, very alpha-minded dogs. And you give him a toy. It's not his toy. It's your toy. You're just letting him play with it. It's not his food. It's your food. You're letting him eat it. And you got to present it that way so that so the dog remembers to know his place and a lot of us we don't know our place dogs have more sense than we do in a lot of ways but what is what else does this imply if your gift is subject to you it doesn't mean you get to do what you want what you want with it but it does mean it's subject to you you know how like a, a football game is subject to the weather 
that if it's raining real hard, that field, if it's if it's natural turf, it's going to be a muddy mess and people are going to be slipping and sliding. I remember a game, I don't really watch football, but I remember when I, I was in college, I just happened to be in, in, in the rec room. Some guys were watching a football game. It was the Houston Oilers and Warren Moon threw this through this long uh, touchdown pass and it, it was raining, it was wet, the ball was wet and this the, the, and the, the receiver, I can't remember his name because I, like I said, I don't watch football. He just barely caught the ball like in his fingertips like that while he was running, it, it just, just in his fingertips and it was just an amazing catch. And everybody was just astounded by it because it, it was it was near miraculous to be able to catch it in those conditions. Because when it's raining, you have different conditions. When it's raining, the game is going to go a different way. It's not going to go the way it went with the, with, with the way it would have gone in in, uh, in dry grass. You know, there was a Super Bowl with the Chicago uh, Chicago Bears many years ago where. I think it was a Super Bowl or a playoff game where the, the whole field was just, there was just dense fog and they played anyway. A lot different playing in the fog. It's a lot different playing in the rain. It's different when you're playing, it's 120 degrees Fahrenheit. The game is subject to the conditions. And likewise, I'm giving you this by way of illustration, that, that your gift is subject to you. What is the, What are the conditions going on in your mind? What are the conditions in your heart? What, are the, what is the condition of your soul? How are you really walking with God? Because some people, they got a gift, but they don't got to walk. Yeah, sometimes you have to stop because you're exhausted. And sometimes uh, there are people who they got a genuine gift, but what they see is distorted. It's just like how I'm nearsighted. So what I'm looking at out the window looks totally different when I got my glasses on. Right now, it's all blurry. Heck, if somebody was in this room or they were across the room, I wouldn't know what, what color their eyes were because I'm nearsighted. I got to put my glasses on. And this happens to us prophetically. God shows us something, but because of whatever conditions we got going on inside of us, very often our perception is distorted. Or we just got some ideologies. We got some preconceived notions. And so we end up interpreting, oh goodness, especially with visions, this is true. People get a vision and they interpret it according to their opinion. They interpret it according to their present knowledge. They interpret it according to their ignorance, especially. You know, it's like, you know, they talk about looking at life through rose-colored lenses. You know, there, there's a distortion. You're seeing things in the wrong colors. And this happens with prophets. Not, maybe not color. I'm not referring specifically to colors. But they don't see things correct. God will show you something, but because you already, very often we've already decided what we want to do, or we already got this certain idea in our heads, so we, did, we end up interpreting what God showed us exactly according to whatever prejudices we already had. Yeah, same here. I, I'll sit on a vision for a long time. I remember one time uh, a friend of mine wanted me to interpret a dream. I said no. Because at that point, I'll be honest with you, I was tired of people coming in here for dream interpretations and prophecies and all this other stuff. And I, I was feeling kind of un, unappreciated and feeling kind of feeling kind of like uh, I was being used. And uh, so I was kind of fed up and annoyed. So I didn't bother to interpret it for a year. <laughs> the dream ended up being about me. But, uh, but anyway, uh, who knows what I delayed for myself with that one. Uh, Hey there, Prophet. It's very good afternoon. God bless you. See, I, I believe in being transparent. Uh, there's a reason why why I teach the way I teach. There's a reason why I, I seem so vehement because I don't want to see you mess up like that. And in other ways that are worse. Hi there. Uh, but my goodness. Uh <sighs> Uh, and I've seen people do it. So God will show them something, and they interpret it. They interpret it just way wrong because they they've got all kinds of crazy ideas in their head. You know, like I, I and we do this all the time. People have, and they think they're prophesying. They think they're discerning. And the truth is, they might even have a gift, but it's subject to them. My goodness, I I don't like to be around prophets who who don't like me. Because they, they come up with some wild crap, man. Uh, I know some folks that they think they, they think they see in the spirit and they'll say all these negative things about me. And I'm thinking, you know, uh, I almost said to one of them, I said, you know, 
Have you ever noticed that none of the prophets we've ever been around, even the ones that don't like me, never say that about me? You'd think somebody would have said something. Especially given my history of people who just love to tell me off. You know, when I was part of a church, I, I think I only ever caught one private rebuke. I think one or maybe two. All the other times I got rebuked by the pastor who was in front of everybody. So I, so I would think that if this if I really had this issue, somebody would have said something. <laughs> oh man. Uh, yeah, so, well, sometimes you have, you have uh, leaders who, uh, they try to use humiliation as a means of control. Insecure leaders love to do that. They'll, they'll humiliate somebody, they'll belittle people. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm supposed, I'm supposedly really mean to, I'm mean and nasty. Uh, that's just really funny because, you know, I, I was like, you know, I, not even the prophets don't like me saying that about me. They'll say other stuff about me, but they've never, I'm, I've never had them call me mean. But, uh, but your gift is subject to you. What do you got inside you? you know, and I've used this, this analogy before. If I gave you a glass of water, a glass of lemonade, and told you that my dog peed in it just a little bit, it's just two drops. Would you drink it? Yum, yum, yum. You probably punch me in the face just for saying that. And I couldn't blame you. Just for suggesting the idea. I don't know somebody, well, you know, if you're, if you're that thirsty, if you're dying, maybe. But you know, the, 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 the central point is here that unless, if you had any other choice, you're not drinking something that had two drops of dog pee in it. You're probably not going to taste it. It may not even harm you in any way, but it's disgusting. And, and what I want you to understand is the same thing happens with the prophetic. Because the vessel is tainted. The vessel is contaminated. The vessel has its own agenda. Yeah, I know I've seen it on uh, Man vs. Wild. I think they got Bear grills a couple of years ago. They put him out somewhere and there was no water. So he drank his own urine. Uh, and, and technically you can survive doing that. I, I, I wouldn't want to have to do it myself. Hope I never have to. But, uh, there's a big difference between drinking yours and drinking the dog's. Uh, that's just disgusting. Let me tell you, dog pee stinks to high heaven. Uh, there's a dog I'm getting ready to adopt, and he's an intact male. Oh my goodness, when he marks territory, you don't want to be nearby. It's, it stinks. But the, uh, and the thing is, spiritually, this stinks too. And we don't even think about it. We give, we give no thought to it. It's like a man said to another man in this movie. He said, you've gone nose deaf. And, you know, he smelled really bad, but he couldn't tell because he's used to it. Everybody else can smell. And a lot of times we got contamination. We, we you know, it, it, it's like, you know, you got a steak that's contaminated with E. coli. It might still taste good, but it's still going to kill you. How much damage is it going to cause? Now, some people argue that God won't allow that. Sure, he will. That's why we, there's so much responsibility involved. That's why there's so much accountability involved. That God will actually allow you. And then sometimes God will stop a person. Did you notice God didn't stop the prophets of Baal? God let Jezebel do her thing for a few years. The God of the Bible. God let Ahab run around acting the fool for years before he, before he finally judged him. And, and people will wonder why. Well, something you got to understand about uh, that kind of leadership. That kind of leadership exists when people don't want God. Yeah. Yeah, and Lisa's making a great point there. If, you're, if your ears are always being tickled in prophecy, there's a problem. You know, we, we all, and don't get me wrong. If, if we're having fellowship together and we're having a service and every time the service comes together, you know, God moves and, and there's prophetic utterance all the time and it really is God, there's nothing wrong with that. 
And that could happen. The problem is that we get fascinated with the word of the Lord and not the Lord of the word. Because the truth is that there usually there's something we want. We want answers. We don't want him. You know, we want some kind of edge. We want an advantage. You know, it's like the guy who wants to wants to know uh, wants to cheat at blackjack. Wants to know, you know, he's counting cards, trying to trying to cheat at blackjack. He just wants an edge because he wants to win. And this is how we, how we treat it. The prophetic is not the lottery. The prophetic is not blackjack. And, uh, and it doesn't have to be so complicated. We overcomplicate things. Because we're not focused on being a worshiper. You know, we want to hear a word of the Lord through the prophet. And we don't listen to the word of the Lord that's in, you know, in this big black book. And, and I know people like to say that a lot. And... And it's almost become trite in, in some circles. People, you know, people have this disdain for scripture now. And, you know, I, I think I've said this in another broadcast. And I'll say it again. You know, I've been, I've been studying the word of God you know, for the better part of 36 years. There were a few years where I wasn't serving God, so I didn't really study it. But I first, started, I first got really interested in the Bible when I was six years old. And just in the last few months, there's, there's, there's been things I've been seeing in Scripture that I never saw before. So don't tell me God can't speak to you through the Word. You know, in the last few months, there's things God showed me in the in, in First Samuel. I've been studying First Samuel since I was six, because that's my name. I was expressly named after that guy. So you know, as, as a kid and as a young man, I was obsessed with the, with the. Uh, with uh, First and Second Samuel, particularly First Samuel, so God can always speak to you through it. But the truth is, a lot of times we, we it's a word that we're interested in, not necessarily a word from the Lord. And there is a difference, and. and the, the unfortunate truth of prophetic ministry is that very often uh, you got a lot of people, like I said, there's folks that they're, they're not prophet, they're psychic. They're not prophet, they're medium. They're not prophet of God at any rate. And some of them have a genuine gift, some of them are really called by God. But then they, they end up operating in a different spirit and we don't even bother to test it. We don't bother to evaluate it. We don't bother to judge what they're saying. Is it consistent with what God already said? And that's that's kind of the scary part of, of, of prophetic ministry is that their gift is subject to, to to their conditions, and we got a lot of prophets running around that are that are uh, we have prophets that are adulterers. That's almost that's almost the norm. Adultery is almost the norm in any, any kind of prominent ministry. In certain circles. Uh, being down low is almost the norm. Not sure what you mean. I don't know if there was a typo in there, but or if I'm reading, if I read it incorrectly, I didn't, didn't make any sense to me. Uh, Maybe I'm just too tired. Well, that's the thing. We're supposed to approach all this stuff with some reverence. And at the same time, like I said in the other broadcast, relax. Well, there's a way to know whether it's from God or not. It comes through relationship. You know, I, I, I said this, uh, well, not on, on Periscope, I don't think. At least not in a long time. Uh, when I'm in... When, when my wife and I go grocery shopping, I usually don't go in the store. I wait in the car. 
because I hate grocery shopping and I've got some injuries that make it really hard for me to spend a lot of time on my feet. Uh, so I'm waiting in the car and I'm sitting there and I'll, I'll go on Periscope or I'll take a nap or whatever. But when my wife comes out of the store, I can recognize her if I just see the top of her head. Because I'm, I'm short. I'm looking out over the cars. I can't see over the cars. All I see is the top of her head and I know it's her. That's all I saw. I see an inch of her head and I know it's her. Why? Because she's my wife. Because I love her. Because I know her. I know her so well. And I know her movements. And I know her walk so well. That I can detect her walk just by the movement of the top of her head. But that came from a relationship. We've been married for almost 10 years now. And I watch her. Even when she doesn't think I'm watching, I watch her. Because well, she's cute. So I, I like to watch her. Uh, but I know her mannerisms. I can, I can recognize her like that. And she can recognize me just by, by my walk at a distance. I'm pretty sure she could probably recognize me by the top of my head. And it made it a little easier because I'm going bald. But the point I'm making here is if you have a real relationship with God, You'll recognize him. Now that's a problem. A lot of us can't can't tell the difference because we don't really have, we don't we have no emphasis on relationship. We have emphasis on performance. Don't worry about the performance. Focus on the relationship. Focus on and in particular getting to know him through the word. I mean, a, a, a lot of us are going to be so embarrassed when we have to stand before God. Because we have this, this tremendous advantage that most of the people who lived in biblical days didn't have. They didn't have this. Most of them, all they had uh, was the first five books and some of the prophetical books. And most of them didn't have it in their home because books were expensive. Because they were made of leather scrolls and you had to kill a lot of sheep to make those scrolls. So if you didn't have a lot of sheep and you couldn't afford to kill a whole lot of sheep, you weren't going to have it in your house. You know, there, there's several billion Bibles on the planet. The average Christian has like six or seven Bibles in their house. We got this tremendous advantage that they didn't have. And we don't use it. So remember that your gift is subject to you. Now that can be a good thing or that can be a bad thing. It can be a bad thing if you are corrupt, if you are, are messed up, if you've got baggage, if you've got all these different things that will distort your perception. There's good reason why we're told to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. There's good reason why we're told if any man be in Christ, then he's a new creature. We like to say that that's a blanket thing. That says, are you really in Christ? A lot of us are in church. We're not in Christ. Yeah, you got to search him out. And you'll seek him if you want him. You know, instead of uh, wanting to, to prophesy, try wanting to know God. To know his mind, to know his will, to know his ways. Everything else uh, will, will fall into place. You know, and, and all my years of prophesying that I know of, I've never delivered a word that was inaccurate or which failed to come to pass. And it's, I don't think it's because I'm some kind of super prophet or these guys like to call themselves master prophet. Uh, it's great marketing to do that. They'll, say, they'll call themselves Master Prophet, Doctor, whatever, and they don't even have a real PhD. Uh, but it's, it's about marketing. Uh, but it's not because I'm some kind of super prophet. It's because, well, first, I, I know how to shut up. Uh, there was a period of, uh, I forget how long it was, but I, I, I did almost no prophesying at all for like a couple of years. And maybe some of it was a little disobedience. I was just kind of sick of everybody. And wanted to be by myself. But uh, I got restraint. I don't just go running off half cocked. I don't just go running my mouth. It's easy to be accurate. 
really easy. All you gotta do is shut up until you're 100% sure that God gave you something to say. Uh, but remember that it is subject to you. And this is not a doom and gloom thing. This shouldn't be depressing. Uh, just know, you know, it's like they say, know thyself. If you know, you know your own tendencies, you know your own issues, you know your own struggles, you know your own insecurities, and those things should drive you to seek God more. Those things should drive you to, when you, ha when you see a vision or perceive something in the spirit or you think God is giving you a word, uh, knowing who you are, what your limitations are, what your issues are, should cause you to want to make sure you really heard from God and that you really understood what he told you or showed you. And maybe it slows things down. Maybe it makes it take a little longer. That's okay. Now, sometimes you won't have to do all that. Sometimes you're just going to know. But again, that comes from relationship. And, and a lot of times, and it's one of the terrible tragedies of modern prophetic ministry is that we have forgotten that this is really about the relationship. It's not about prophecy. It's not about prophesying. It's not about getting a word or giving a word or receiving a word. The whole point of the mission of the prophet was to cause people to draw close to God. That they would know him. That they would have fellowship with God. That is the whole point. We tend to, to miss the forest for the trees. And we're so focused on, on the prophetic. We're so focused on prophesying or receiving a prophecy or so on and so forth. And we forgot that the whole purpose of all of this is fellowship with God. Focus on the fellowship. And it'll change who you are. And then the fact that your gift is subject to you stops, become, stops becoming a liability. Well, folks, I hope that was helpful. If it was, uh, feel free to share the broadcast on whatever social media you use. Uh, meanwhile, God bless you and God keep you. And the prophetess can be just catch us on the tail end, but the, uh, the replay will be there. And uh, I'll post it from the, the Catch channel too. Y'all have a good night. God bless.